Okay, guys, how are you? How you doing? I know, right? I always say that. Yeah. Okay, good to see you guys. Hopefully, we'll get over 100 by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ for the glory of Jesus. And if you guys are wondering why I'm asking for over 100, even get 1,000 eventually, like Christian Prince and David Wood, is because I want more people to learn <clears throat> this material, absorb it by the power of the Holy Spirit, and use it for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? And I'll comment about recalling Scripture in a minute. But keep praying for me, folks, in Jesus' name. I'm in a new state, and I'm trusting by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of Jesus Christ, I'll settle here for the foreseeable future. But still, my freedom is in the hands of others, and I need the Lord Jesus Christ and his infinite love and power, mercy and compassion to turn their hearts favorably towards me. So pray for divine favor, miraculous favor, the same favor the Lord Jesus gave Joseph in the sight of his friends and foes, that the powers that be will like me, and see that I'm a servant of Jesus and work with me to help me to get established here. So please, and ask the Lord Jesus to save me from the other state and that filthy, wicked, corrupt judge. And more importantly, pray the Lord Jesus will flood my daughters in his infinite love, compassion, mercy, provide for them overabundantly and provide through me for them to, pro to provide for our daily needs, to depend on no one but on his grace, and that he'll bring them to my arms sooner than later in Jesus' name. As you can see, I'm here for now until I get my own place. So I need your prayers. I'm staying with my oldest brother. Pray for him. Pray the Lord Jesus bless him and his family. He's gracious enough to allow me to stay here for as long as <clears throat> I need to. But I want to find a place real soon. So that means ask God for his grace to open doors of blessing that no man can shut. And to continue to provide for me if he wants me to do ministry. Because I have to find a place. You know, because this is his home, so I have to find time when I can use his internet connection. And so nobody's here now, but they can walk in any minute. And I don't want to be a burden on them. You know, they're being gracious to me. So can you guys partner with me and pray for me and fast for me? Because I'm still not out of the woods. But in Jesus' name, I am trusting. He brought me here. He's going to keep me here and bring my daughters to me. Amen? You guys trusting with me? Are you going to pray for me? Because I really need your prayers because God is real. Jesus is alive and he answers prayers and he's a God of the miraculous. So pray for my miracles. And don't forget to continue to pray for David Wood. Pray the Lord Jesus will just destroy that cancer, that skin cancer, and give him and I perfect health to use us mightily for his glory for many more years. He doesn't need us, right? Now let me comment on the question that I was asked. How am I able to recall scriptures the way I do? <clears throat> Okay, let me answer that so we can go into the meat of the matter. Trusting the Holy Spirit to fill me for the glory of Jesus, right? And we'll pray because we need the Holy Spirit to fill us. We need the Holy Spirit to seal us. We need the Holy Spirit to train us, to discipline us, to transform us and empower us to be in love with Jesus Christ, to conform to the image of Jesus Christ, to act like Jesus Christ, to love like Jesus, and to be in love with Jesus. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, Early on, when I started doing ministry in the late 90s, because I got into full-time ministry in 1999. Mark that date. 1999 was the year that God put in my heart to do full-time ministry. Okay? Early on, I realized I was able to recall verses from the scriptures <clears throat> without even trying. So when people say, what method you use, I didn't. This is truly a gift of the Holy Spirit that he gave me to make it easier for me to glorify Jesus Christ in teaching and debating. So give the triune God, give the Holy Spirit all glory, honor, and praise for this gift because it's the Holy Spirit who gives the gifts that he deems fit to every individual member of the body of Christ. But now, though you're impressed with that, don't be. Let me tell you why you shouldn't be. Jesus Christ, our Lord, is not impressed with people who recall scripture because if you remember in Matthew chapter 4, and Luke 4, Satan cited scripture, Psalm 91, from memory. Let me repeat this. Listen to me because I want your undivided attention. And in Jesus' name, we're going to get about 200 today. Okay. Satan, Satan quoted Psalm 91 from memory. If you go to Matthew 4, Luke 4, and he misquoted it, misinterpreted it, misapplied it against the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. What's the point? And we ask Jesus to bless the internet connection. It is not 
how much scripture you can recall. It's how much scripture you can live out perfectly by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus wants doers of his word. And this is where I lack. I have anger issues. I'm impatient. I can stress out. <clears throat> I can whine and complain. I struggle with carnal desires. So what you need to pray for yourselves and me, that the Holy Spirit will fill us with such power to crucify, destroy the flesh, to war against the flesh and walk in the life of the Spirit, to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit and to be filled with power to worship our God, to worship the Father, to worship the Son, to worship the Holy Spirit perfectly. Praying without ceasing, fasting, studying the Word, understanding it and then applying it, serving others by our deeds. People who are in financial need, helping them out financially. People who are in prison, visiting them. People in hospitals, visiting them. Doing the work that Jesus Christ has called us to do for the glory of Jesus, right? So although you're impressed with this, don't be. Thank Jesus that he gave me this gift. Ask the Holy Spirit to perfect this gift in me, to use it for his glory and to teach you. But, <clears throat> and I'm saying this with humbleness, the Lord wants people to do his will. In fact, that when you get a chance this week, read Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, and read that when the Lord Jesus Christ will judge the nations, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, I want you to remember this. <clears throat> when he judges the nations, he will separate the nations as a sheep is separated from, as sheep are separated from goats, the sheep on his right, the goats on his left. And you know what he's going to judge them on? These are professing Christians, by the way, because they call him Lord. He's going to judge them on their obedience to his commands and the love they demonstrated by their deeds to those in need for the sake of Jesus or their, the lack thereof. In other words, the ones on the right are blessed because they loved the least of Jesus' brothers by their deeds. They fed those who were hungry. They gave drink to those who were thirsty. They visited those who were in prison. They invited and welcomed strangers in, in contrast to those on the left. So notice he's judging them on the basis of their fruits, their deeds, their obedience to his will to love one another by our deeds and not just pay lip service. Okay, that's Matthew 25, 31 to 46. <clears throat> Trover Lefroy, I have given permission. I'll give it again. You can take all my articles, all my videos, translate them in any language for the glory of Jesus, provided you don't sell them and try to make money off of them, right? So you have my permission. Don't ask me again. You have my permission to take all the articles, all the videos, download them, translate them for the glory of Jesus because we want multitudes to hear the truth of God and fall in love with Jesus, okay? Let me briefly talk about the two ways a person can sin. There are two ways in which you can sin, according to Scripture. Matthew 25, 31 to 46 shows you one of the two ways. You sin by not doing what God commands you to do, and you sin by doing the things that God prohibits. So you either sin by doing things God tells you not to do, or you sin by failing to do the things that God requires of you. It's known as sin of commission and sin of omission. Matthew 25, 31 to 46, that's the sin of omission. God is condemning those on the left, the goats, for failing to do what Jesus commanded them to do. Right? And you'll find that in James chapter 4, verses 16 to 17. And thank our brother Protestant and the admins for helping me to help you. Protestant, if you can pose James 4, 16 to 17. In fact, let's read the context. James 4, 13 to 17, and give me your undivided attention. Okay? Listen. For some reason, my face looks like it's radiating, right? And I pray that I continue to radiate with the light of Jesus, the beauty of Jesus, and that I <clears throat> manifest the beauty of Jesus Christ. As he makes me answer for his glory, right? I mean, some reason why. It just feels you know, like I'm radiating. Okay, James 4, 13 and 17. Read with me. Guys, pay attention. This is a command. Follow it now. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. 
Now, he's telling people who plan ahead, who have future plans, how to <clears throat> plan ahead, what to say when you make plans for the future. Pay attention, James 4.14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For what? For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Did you catch what he just said? Pay attention to what he just said. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. You may die today. You're a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. God may command your soul to leave your body and you die. So when you make plans about the future, <clears throat> always say, if the Lord wills, if the Lord Jesus wills, I'm going to go and do such and such tonight. If the Lord Jesus wills, if the Lord wills, I'm going tomorrow to a specific place. So here you're commanded. Anytime you speak about the future, say, if the Lord wills. In fact, the Muslims took it from us. Muslims will often say, inshallah, 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 if Allah wills. They're taking this from the Bible. We're the ones who are supposed to say, if the Lord wills, I will teach tonight. If the Lord wills, I'll see you tonight. If the Lord wills, I'm going tomorrow for a job interview. So now you're commanded to say, you have to do this because now look at James 4, 16 to 17. James 4, 16 to 17, one more time. That's why if you notice when I announce something on my social media pages, I often say, Lord willing, God willing. Now, notice what he then says in James 4, 16 to 17. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. You boast and you brag, Lord Jesus, bless the internet connection for your glory by your power. All such rejoicing is evil. Don't rejoice in your pride, your arrogance, and your conceit. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Did you catch it? To him who knows the good to do but fails to do it, that person is sinning. Now you've been told two things. Don't boast, right? And don't rejoice in your boasting, taking pride in your achievements or how great you are or how wise you are or how rich you are or how handsome you are or how fit you are. Don't boast in these things, right? And always say, if the Lord wills. Now, if you fail to do that, you're sinning against God. Is that clear? So what's the point? There are two ways in which there are two ways in which you can sin against God. Exactly equip apologetics, Nick. There are two ways in which you can sin against God. Failing to do the good that God commands and doing the things that God condemns and prohibits. Failing to do the good is called sin of omission. <clears throat> right? And doing the things that God condemns is the sin of commission. Is that clear? By the power of the Holy Spirit, as he gives us unction and clarity to understand the word and live it for the glory of Jesus. Is that clear? No, Bernie. Chase and rebuke them. Okay. All right. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, thank you for the health you've given us today. And thank you for giving us this opportunity, giving me the opportunity to again be used by your Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. We love your son, the Lord Jesus. We love your Holy Spirit. Anoint us, every one of us, with wisdom and power and knowledge from your Holy Spirit. And Father, please bless the internet connection. Grant me clarity of thought and speech. Save me from error. Save me from confusion. Save me from stammering and misinterpretation of Scripture. And destroy my impatience. And save me from unrighteous anger, Father, to be a blessing to your people, to love your people, and to be used of your spirit, to build up your people, the church of Jesus Christ. Cover us with the blood of Jesus. Cover my angels with the blood of Jesus. Wash us. Wash my daughters in the blood of Jesus. And fill us. Fill my daughters with your Holy Spirit. And provide for us overabundantly, Father. And please, Father, grant me favor and grace here in this state. Turn the hearts of the people favorable towards me. So that I can be planted here and be used by your spirit to start Bible studies and to teach the word, Father. You don't need me. We need you, Father. And fight for us, Father. We need you. We need the Lord Jesus. We need your Holy Spirit. Fill us and anoint us by your spirit. And bless this session for your glory. 
Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants and fill my lungs and my chest and throat with help that I need by, by and from your spirit to do this, Father. Please, we need you. We love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Do you think you can always understand that you're first one within the God's will, or do you think they feel that I say? No, you need to say, if the Lord wills, anytime you make a decision about anything, because you don't know. In fact, here, let me prove it to you. Hey, good, 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 Nick, brother. Let me prove it to you that you need to say, if the Lord wills, because you don't know whether you're going to live tomorrow or die because you're a vapor here today, gone tomorrow. I just received news. A young brother, a young apologist in love with Jesus Christ in his 20s, on fire for the Lord came up to us while we were in New York, the A-team. David Wood, Vocab Malone, Adam Coleman, John, John, what do you mean? That's his YouTube page, myself. We were in New York for an apologetics conference, and we went to, I believe, Manhattan, or was it Brooklyn? One of those two places to see Michael Brown debate live Shmuley Boteik. A young man in his 20s, in love with Jesus, came up to us and was excited and went out to dinner with us. Now, God bless David Wood, a very, let me just say something about David Wood. He's very generous, very, very open-handed, and he gives the money that God blesses him with. It's not only for his family. He actually gives very generously to other brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. So David Wood paid for his dinner that night. Okay, now, pay attention to this. I just received word several days ago from his aunt in Florida. That young man died last week in his sleep. He was in his 20s. He had respiratory problems, went to sleep and never woke up. He went to sleep and entered into glory. He went to sleep and a spirit left his body, entered heaven, and he's now more alive, perfectly healthy in the presence of Jesus Christ. Yet his parents, his siblings are devastated. So although he's alive and filled with the joy and peace of Jesus Christ, his parents are devastated. His aunt was crying as she was communicating to me his story. But you know what she told me? You know what she told me? That weekend that he met us was one of the best moments in his life because he couldn't stop talking about it to his family members. He was excited. He was just on fire that he had met some of his apologetic heroes, right? And yet now he's in glory with Jesus, seeing the God-man and worshiping at his feet. But you get what I'm trying to say here. That young man did not think that he, when he went to sleep that night, he would enter glory. He thought he'd awaken in this life, in this world, Continuing to do ministry for the glory of Jesus Christ. Don't take it as a joke because, guys, I can die tonight. Even though in my mind I think I'm going to have many more years, I may die. I may get hit by a car. I may get killed. Right? I may have a heart attack. Only God knows. So take James 4, 13 to 15 to heart. It's not a joke. You do not know when the Lord will command you. To leave this world, when the Lord will command your spirit to leave your body and your body returns to the dust and you stand before him. Holy Eternity, don't ask me that question because a person cannot die unless God permits it. Death is in the hands of the triune God. So he died because God permitted his death. No, see, Rayoku, here's where you're not understanding the point. Guys, Rai Oku, everyone else, you still don't get it. Don't you understand God doesn't need us? We need him. We depend on him. The work of God will be finished, will be completed because of the triune God, not because of us. In other words, it is an honor that God would use us to accomplish his will on earth to bring about the return of Jesus Christ. But when we die, that doesn't mean the work of God is left undone. Because God will raise up people better than us, more in love with him, more spirit-filled, with more wisdom to continue the work 
Because the work of God depends on God, not on us. And God is the one who creates people and raises them up and empowers them to accomplish his work on earth. So don't ever think you need anyone. You need God and he will supply your needs. And if God is pleased to use me to supply your needs, may he be glorified. But he doesn't need me. And I'm trying to let you know this. So don't say, oh my goodness, there's so much work on finishing. No. If God calls me home, that means my role in fulfilling his perfect will is complete. It's done. And others will continue. Are you understand? Are you understand this? Is this sinking in? Is this sinking in? Khalas. Exactly, Lisa. Khalas. If I die today, that means my role in fulfilling God's will on earth and bringing about God's will on earth is done. It's over. My part in bringing his will to fruition is done. But others will continue doing the work by the grace of God until the return of Jesus Christ our Lord. And I'll give you an example in the life of Stephen. When you get a chance, I want you to read Matthew 25, 31, 46. And then I also want you to read Acts chapter 6 and 7. Acts chapter 6 and 7. Read both those chapters. Are you with me there? Acts chapter 6 and 7. Why? Because it's a story of Stephen. It says, Stephen was filled with wisdom and the Holy Spirit, filled with grace. And he had the face of an angel. Okay. All right. That's what I told you. How's it doing now? Okay. Keep praying because we have an internet connection that's not the best. It's not ideal, right? Yeah. If I got raptured, I would have left you behind. Okay. Again, in Jesus' name, may the Lord Jesus enable recall the point I was making. Okay. I want you to read Acts chapter 6 and 7. Acts 6 and 7 because it's the story of Stephen. Hey, is that James White or is that someone pretending to be James White? Come on. Why would someone pretend to be James White with his picture? Is that really you? Fake? Oh, come on, man. Don't mock him, man. All right. Actually, I got excited. Anyway, read Acts 6 and 7. Acts 6 and 7. You'll see it says, Stephen was a man filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with wisdom, with grace, and the Holy Spirit, and had the face of an angel. Acts chapter 6 and 7. Pay attention, folks. Pay attention. Don't let Satan distract you. Rebuke that in Jesus' name. He was very eloquent in the scriptures, very powerful in the scriptures, had a thorough command of the Old Testament. And you'll see that in Acts 7. He recounts the entire history of Israel up until the coming of Jesus Christ and indicts the Jews for not only murdering the prophets, but for murdering the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that the prophets announced was to come, right? Now, as mighty as a man of God, <clears throat> Stephen was, and he was one of the original deacons. In Acts 6, that's where we find the first mention of deacons, why deacons were appointed, and he was one of the seven deacons. Are you with me there? You're getting yourself distracted by the devil because of this fake James White account. Focus for the glory of Jesus, folks. Learn. This is Satan's attempt of distracting you. He was one of the seven deacons. So Acts 6 even tells you why deacons were appointed, the, the role and function of deacons. And he was one of the original seven deacons. Another one was Philip the evangelist. Now, he was a mighty man of God, filled with the Spirit, who had absolute mastery of the Old Testament, right? And he confounded the Jews to the point they killed him. Now, I'm going to show you what I mean, that when you die... It's not because you were taken prematurely and there was work for you to finish that you left undone. You died because God permitted your death, which means your role on earth and bringing about the will of God was done. Your part was over. Now you enter your rest and enjoy Jesus and worship at the feet of Jesus. Okay, are you ready now to show you this point being illustrated in the life and death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr? And how God then raised up someone else to take his place. Are you ready for me to show you that? Are you ready? 
What does that got to do with believers accomplishing God's will on earth? Okay, let's go. Acts 7, 55 all the way to 60. Acts 7, 55 to 60, and then we're going, going to the topic. Acts 7, verses 55 to 60. Read with me. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Pay attention. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. They didn't want to hear it because they perceived it to be blasphemy. And ran upon him with one accord. Now pay attention to verse 58. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. So Saul was there approving the death of Stephen. Saul, whom we know as Paul. Pay attention now, 59 and 60. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Don't condemn them for murdering me. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now notice chapter 8, verse 1. Chapter 8, verse 1. Chapter 8, verse 1. Pay attention here. There were no chapter divisions in the original Greek manuscripts. Now watch here, chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Did you catch it? Saul was consenting unto his death. You see, you don't understand why Luke mentions Saul in the context of Stephen being the first Christian martyr, martyred for the glory of Jesus. Do you know why? Not only to show that Saul was a persecutor of the church, but to show you that Stephen's prayer was honored when Stephen said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. God honored the prayer of his righteous, righteous servant, the first Christian martyr who died as a martyr for the glory of Jesus by bringing Saul to faith. And then Saul continues the work of Stephen on earth. Did you catch it? You hit that like button. So Saul's job was, was done, and I'm sorry, Stephen's job was done. He did his part, and he did it with honor to the end, and offered his life as a sacrifice for the glory of Jesus. And then God honors his prayer by then converting Saul, who was there. And so now Saul takes the place of Stephen and continues the work of Stephen, which is why it is not a coincidence that Saul, like Stephen, was mighty in scriptures, had a thorough command of the Old Testament like Stephen did. Did you catch it? Is it sinking in? I hope it does, Christian warrior. May the Spirit move all of us to tears. So you understand, Stephen died not because he left his work undone. He died... Because from God's perspective, he did everything God wanted him to do, and he did it with honor to the point he died as the first Christian martyr glorifying Jesus Christ, not only in the way he lived, but by his death. And then as he prayed, God honors his prayer by then forgiving Saul and transforming Saul to continue the work that Stephen had, had done on earth who also, like Stephen, was filled with the Spirit and mighty in the Old Testament. Yep, Moses and Joshua, Elijah and Elisha, so on and so forth. Is it making sense now? So what's the point of all this? No one in Jesus Christ dies... without completing the task that God had assigned for him or her. You die exactly when God wants you to die and permits you to die. And if he allows you to die today, that means your job is done. It's complete. You finished the role, the assignment God had assigned to you. So don't ever say, oh, there's so much work for me to finish. My job is unfinished, and how can I die now? No, 
No. Wrong attitude. Let me repeat. God doesn't need you, doesn't need me. It is an honor and a privilege that God would say, I'm going to use you and use you and empower you to finish the work or to bring about the completion of the work, my will honor, leading to the return of Jesus Christ. You with me there? Is that clear? Is that clear? I just want to make sure before I move on to the next point. So never think, never think God needs you, needs me. We need him, and it's an honor and a privilege and a blessing that you, Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, would use us, would use me. May my life bring you glory, and my death bring you glory even more in Jesus' name. Right Now let me prove to you that God doesn't need us. So don't ever say, we need you, Sam. That's idolatry. Sam, we need you. No, you don't. You don't. May God purify your hearts and purify my hearts and save us from our ego and our pride and our flesh. Never say you need a human teacher. No, you don't. You don't. You don't need David Wood. You don't need Sam Shimon. You don't need Anthony Rogers. You don't need James White. You don't need us. You need the triune God. You need the Father. You need the Son. You need the Holy Spirit. It is idolatry. When you make a man, a human being, more than he or she is and depend on that person, that's idolatry. Right? You with me there? That's idolatry. That's why I'm not worried for you guys. I worry for me because God can stop me from teaching and as a way of discipline and saying, I don't need you, Sam. And here, I'm going to take you out of ministry. God forbid. It'll be like a fish out of water. May God have mercy on me and forgive me and be patient with me and use me till I die to glorify Jesus. But I'm not worried for you. If I die, so what? It's not going to be the end of your faith or the end of Christianity. The only thing I contribute in this process is mistakes, sins, and causing people to stumble. I take responsibility for those things, not God. Everything good and perfect for me is from God. Let me show you another passage so we can go into the topic. Acts 17, 24 to 25. Let's break down Acts 17, 24, 25, and then we'll continue to 28. But let's first look at Acts 17, 24, and 25. Watch here. Read with me. Here goes Haterwood in Israel. He's still he's still stalking me in Israel. The dude is with a Colombo wannabe and a Hawaiian-looking metrosexual, right? And a wild hillbilly whose YouTube page should be renamed to the 30-minute apologist. And he's here stalking me. Wow, even in Israel. Anyway, Acts 17, 24 to 25. Let's read. God that made the world and all things therein. Pay attention, folks. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth. He is the Lord of all creation. He owns all creation. He created all things. Dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Pay attention to 25. Neither is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything seeing he give it to all life and breath and all things. Post 25, one more time. It's ironic. We're quoting Acts 17, and Acts 17 apologetics shows up right when we quote Acts 17. Right? Pay attention, folks. Read Acts 17 one more time. Read it one more time. Read it with me. Neither is God worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Let me repeat it again. Neither is, is God worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he is the one who gives all life and breath and all things. He's the one who gives us life. He's the one who gives us everything we need for life so that he doesn't depend on us. We depend on him. Is that sinking in? Did that sink in? My question is, do you believe it though? Do you believe it? If you do, you're going to stop saying, 
God needs David Wood. In fact, I think the church would be better off without David Wood, but that's just my opinion. But God is wiser than me, okay? Or God needs me to go preach the gospel. No, he doesn't. We need him. And then he will raise up people to teach you the word, to help you attain a level of spiritual maturity that you can then teach others. Everything is from him. This James White wannabe is pretending. <laughs> All right, you get me? Now, now let's read 26 to 28. 26 to 28. We can begin. 26 to 28. And hath made, God has made of one blood from one human being all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and had determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord. He's placed you exactly where you're at when you're there for the express purpose of seeking him, finding him because he wants you to know him, right? Notice 27 again, that they should seek the Lord. If perhaps happily is only English means if perhaps they might feel after him, you know, desire him and, and groan for him and ache for him, right? And find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Now, 28, for in him, it is because of God we live and move and have our being. It is because of him you exist, I exist. It's because of him we are able to breathe and, and move and, and function. It's all because of him. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Is it sinking in? Is it now sinking in? Never say God needs you or you need this teacher. Always say everything I have, everything I need comes from God. It is God that I need and depend on, and he will supply my needs and create human beings and raise up human beings to teach me the word until I attain spiritual maturity and then use of God to teach others. Is that clear? Clear? So don't assume someone's death caught God by surprise. It didn't. So I know you guys love me. And believe me, let me tell you something, folks. I'm a damaged, imperfect sinner who also craves love and affirmation. Because growing up, I didn't have much of it. And again, by way of confession, I just share this with you guys, to be honest. I do suffer with low self-esteem, even though that's not the impression I give. When you look at me, you think that I'm very strong and confident. No, it's not a mask. It's just God empowers me by his spirit, by his spirit to be very bold and confident in preaching the word. But apart from that, I suffer with low self-esteem. And God heal me of that because that can be a symptom of pride as well. Right? So, so don't get me wrong. I do love attention and affirmation because I've lacked that growing up. But the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, I know you love me when you affirm me, but don't make me more than I am. And I know you won't because at the end of the day, if Jesus takes me home today, you will still <clears throat> continue to love Jesus you will still continue to grow. You will still be united to Christ because the Holy Spirit is our God who seals us, preserves us, teaches us, perfects us, and guides us to the right teachers to grow. Okay? Just remember that. Second Corinthians 12, verse 6. Second Corinthians 12, verse 6. Exactly, Andrew Martin. And in Jesus' name, Andrew Martin will come to Christ sooner than later. Before I die, I will see that. Before the Lord takes me, I will see Andrew Martin preaching Jesus and him crucified. 
right? Now, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 6. As well as my daughters, that if the Lord is pleased and he tarries, my daughters grow up to be healthy, vibrant, beautiful girls in love with Jesus. Now read 2 Corinthians 12, verse 6 with me. Guys, read. For though I would desire to glory, meaning boast, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he, he heareth of me. One more time. Let's look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 6. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 6. One more time. Pay attention. One more time. I want you to pay attention to what Paul just said. Notice what Paul said. For though I would desire to glory, boast, I shall not be a fool, because boasting about yourself is being a fool. Now notice what he says here. Pay attention to the heart of Paul. May we have the heart of Paul. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, I endure, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Did you see that? I will refrain from boasting about the things I've done for the glory of Christ, because I don't want any man to make me more than I am. That's a true slave of Jesus. That's the heart of a true slave of Jesus, a heart made alive by the Spirit, filled with love for Jesus Christ. A true slave of Jesus will say, never make me more than I am. Because I am nothing without Jesus. I am nothing apart from Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. Amen, Zarina. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. Notice what Paul says here. Guys, read. Read, please, and understand and live it out. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. It is God's grace that empowered me. His grace gave me the power from the Spirit to be what I am. And His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. It wasn't wasted on me. Because that grace empowered me to bring about the will of God on earth, and to perform mighty deeds for the glory of Christ. It wasn't wasted on me. God did not waste his grace on me by empowering me by the Spirit. Now watch what he says. But I labored more abundantly than, than they all. Yet not I, not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Did you see it? I am what I am because of the grace of God. I've done more to advance the kingdom of Christ than all the rest of the apostles, but it wasn't me. It was the grace of God because his favor poured out the spirit who empowered me to do more than any other apostle. So he gets the glory. Right? So again, may God purify my heart and motives to mean it from my heart. Don't get me wrong. It is not a sin to glorify Jesus Christ for the life of someone used in your life. In other words, it is not a sin when you say, praise Jesus for using Sam Shamoon to illuminate me and just to blow my mind with the depth of Scripture. Glory to God. That is not something sinful. When it becomes sin, when you depend on me, that's when it becomes sinful. Proverbs 27, verse 2. Because notice what Proverbs 27, verse 2 states. Proverbs 27, verse 2. Watch here. Let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. So here it's saying, let others praise God for the work he's doing in and through you. Let others magnify Jesus and thank Jesus for the life of a David Wood and Sam Shamoon. But you yourself don't boast about yourself. Let someone else boast. Look what Jesus is doing through this man, Sam Shimon. He's absolutely nothing apart from Jesus. And look at the love of Jesus for this man, the way he's using him for the glory of Christ. Right? Okay. If now that's clear, let's go into the meat of the matter, how the synoptic gospels affirm that Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh even though he's not the Father or the Holy Spirit. I tried to start this last time, but my goodness, were we under attack and stress because people were not getting it and I was getting frustrated, right? 
right? But today, in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to focus. Notice, you guys are being distracted because I don't know if it's Gerald Stephen who brought it up. Yahya Snow and Muslim by choice, merciful servant, right? They are the sewage of Islam. They are no better than their prophet. Like their prophet, they are dogs. May God grant them repentance leading to eternal life. Why are you allowing these dogs of Satan to distract you? Because they attack Nabil Qureshi saying that his cancer was Allah's judgment upon him. Why are you allowing the devil to distract you? I don't get it. I thought you're smarter than the devil because you have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Right? Hit that like button, guys. Come on now. Now let's focus in Jesus' name. My purpose in this session is to prepare you for a full and in-depth exegesis of John chapter 1. But before I go to John, I want to demonstrate that John's view of Jesus is perfectly consistent with the view of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All four Gospels, pay attention here, all four Gospels identify Jesus Christ as Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, distinct from the Father and the Holy Spirit. But they present the deity of Christ in their own peculiar, unique manner as they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. Are you with me there? So I want to already destroy the objection by Muslims and other anti-Trinitarians that it's only in John's gospel where you get the depiction of Jesus as God Almighty in the flesh Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not depict Jesus as Jehovah God of the Old Testament. So I want to destroy that lie by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So that when I get to John, all of you have been prepared to see that what John says about Jesus, that he is Jehovah God of the Old Testament who becomes flesh, flesh and blood human being, one with the Father and the Spirit, is something he didn't make up or invent, but it was the belief of Jesus and his first followers, his Jewish followers, and all of his followers proclaimed that same truth in their proclamation and in their writings. Right? I have no idea what this guy is saying. It happens to you, Sam Shemadu, the devil does not have any way how to take you down from what you are. Okay. All right, in Jesus' name. Okay, are we ready now? I'm going to start with Luke and Acts. Even though I said Synoptic Gospels, Luke who wrote Luke also wrote Acts. Let's try it again because last time, boy, did we have a hard time understanding this. I pray in Jesus' name we can focus. Okay, Acts 1, verses 9 and 12. Please, guys, I need your undivided attention. I need you to focus. Now, hold on as I get a drink. I'm going to whistle in the brink back up. We were saying hello. I don't want to see something. Hold on, guys. You gotta admit, man, I'm getting getting healthier, handsomer, right? Handsomer. By the grace of Jesus Christ. And here's Bruce Lee. They call me the Bruce Lee of apologetics. You feel very much at home here, Mr. Opa. Why are you getting apprehensive? <laughs> Mr. Opa, don't con me. Don't con me. Oh. Right? It is like a finger pointing away to the moon. <clears throat> don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory. Do you understand? Never take your eyes off your opponent, even when you bow. By way of confession, Bruce Lee was one of the biggest influences on my life. I really love this guy, and I hope he's in heaven. I would love to see him in heaven. He died so tragically young, 32 years old. But anyway. Okay, now, Acts 1, 9 to 11. Acts 1, 9 to 11. Let's read, guys. Now focus in Jesus' name. Focus. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. Our Lord Jesus Christ was taken up. 
Pay attention. Our Lord Jesus Christ was taken up in full view of the apostles <clears throat> 40 days after his physical resurrection. This is 40 days after his physical resurrection. If you read Acts 1, starting at verse 1. Focus now. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Right? Now let read verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. I'm repeating it again so that you catch it. But let me go back to 9. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So physically he went up into a cloud and disappeared, took off with the cloud. Now let's go to 11. Pay attention, 11, and then 12. 11 and 12. Guys, I need you to focus in Jesus' name. Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So this same Jesus that you saw physically taken up into a cloud and disappeared, he's going to come back in the same manner. Only difference is he ascended this time. He's going to descend the second time. Now, verse 12, notice where Jesus left from, the place that Jesus physically ascended. Notice verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Now, did everyone get the point? Jesus physically was taken up from the Mount of Olives, entered a cloud, and disappeared in the cloud. The angels say the way he left is the way he'll come back. So that means one day a cloud will appear, and then Jesus physically will come down from the cloud and descend where? To the Mount of Olives, right? Right? Are you getting it so far? Okay. Now, why do I say physically? Because according to the Bible, Jesus has a physical body of flesh and bones. When God raised the body on the third day, it was Jesus' physical body that had been crucified, that died, that now is made immortal, indestructible. Let me prove that to you. Luke 24, 39 the same author who wrote Acts wrote Luke, Luke 24, 39. Focus, don't ask questions, focus. Luke 24, 39. Focus. Jesus appearing to them that first Easter Sunday. Notice what he says to them. Behold my hands and my feet. Behold my hands and my feet. That is, I myself handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye See me have. So Jesus is saying, look, I have a body of flesh and bones. I'm not just a spirit. Those spirits have a shape and form, a spiritual body. It's not a body of flesh and bones. That's unique to creatures of the earth. Creatures of the earth have bodies of flesh and bone. Since so Jesus became human, took on the nature of a human being, took on a created nature, he added the nature of humanity to himself. In respect to his human nature, he has a physical body of flesh and bones that he raised immortal and destructible. Right? Did you read that? Did you get it? Yes. Jesus will return in a body of flesh and bone, not as a spirit. Now, let's look at Acts 2, 29 to 32 for further proof. We'll read 33 as well. Acts 2, 29, 32. Here, Peter quotes a Psalm of David to prove that David the prophet, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, saw the resurrection of Jesus and then prophesied about his resurrection. Read with me, please. Please, you got to get it. If you're not getting it, say, I'm not getting it. Acts 2, 29, 32. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. He's been dead. He's been buried. God didn't raise him to life. And his sep sepulchre, his tomb, is with us unto this day. His tomb is still here with his remains. But now notice verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, he was a prophet who received revelation from the Holy Spirit, and God promised him, that of the fruit of his loins, from his own physical line, a physical descendant of his, according to the flesh, 
he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So God promised David, I'm going to raise up the Christ from your physical flesh, from your physical line. He'll be a physical descendant of you. Now watch 31. And he's seeing this. Not only did God tell him, but God by the Spirit showed him in advance. Seeing this in advance, right? Spake of the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul, Christ's soul, was not left in hell. Hades, neither his flesh, neither the flesh of Christ saw corruption. Here, Peter's saying God showed David and promised David the Messiah would be a physical descendant of his, which means he'd be truly human, and that God would not allow the flesh body, the physical body of Christ, to, to decay, to see corruption. How did God prevent the physical flesh body of Christ, of Jesus, prevent it from corrupting? Verse 32 tells you, This Jesus, Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Okay. Let's now unpack it. You see what Peter is telling the Jews. God swore to David the Christ would be a physical descendant of his. Right? He would come from David's line physically. So Christ would be a human being. And God swore to David that the physical flesh body of Christ would never corrupt. Though he would die... His flesh body would not see corruption. And how did God preserve the flesh body of Christ from corrupting? By raising that body of flesh to life on the third day, making his body of flesh immortal, indestructible. And then Peter says, we are the witnesses that saw the Christ Raised physically in his body of flesh. We saw that body of flesh. We touched that body of flesh. And we are witnesses. Jesus is alive in his body of flesh. Did you get it? Before I move on? I hope you get it. Because last time we spent an hour. And then I deleted the video because we weren't getting it. So this should prepare you to understand much more. Clear? Yes, they say medically a body starts decomposing on the fourth day, Jonathan. That's what they say, but I'm no medical doctor, but I've heard that. So then let me ask you the question. You have just seen proof. This is how I'm going to know that you're paying attention. You're understanding by the power of the Holy Spirit. You've just seen proof that Jesus was raised in that physical body of flesh and bones. And that body of flesh has now been made immortal, indestructible. Jesus' physical body cannot die, cannot be destroyed anymore. Right? Okay. So when the disciples saw Jesus taken up from the Mount of Olives, they saw with their eyes. That's why they were looking intently. They were, they were not looking like, they were like this. They were shocked and in awe. We have never seen a physical body ascend, enter a cloud, and disappear. They were blown away. So this isn't this proof that they saw Jesus in a physical body that had hands and feet, physical hands and feet. They saw a body of flesh enter a cloud and disappear, right? He's infinitely good. It is amazing. It should blow your minds away. Right? Okay. So when the angel said the way he left is the way he will come, if he left physically in a cloud, that means one day a cloud will appear and a physical body will come down. Now, if he left the Mount of Olives, when Jesus descends out of the cloud in that physical body, his physical body will land where? Where will his physical body land? Where would his physical body land? Acts 1.12. One more time. You got it. Every one of you got it. Where's the same place, though? 
You guys got it, Mount of Olives. But let's look at Acts 1.12 because now you're going to receive proof that according to Acts, Jesus is Jehovah God, the God of Zechariah. Pay attention to verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Jesus left physically the Mount of Olives, will return physically Mount of Olives. Now here is proof that Luke just portrayed Jesus as Jehovah God of the Old Testament. Let's go to Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Get ready to be blown away. Many of you already know this from previous sessions. But now read Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Get ready to be blown away. Read, guys. You guys really got to pay attention to verses 3 to 5. Behold, the day of Jehovah is good. I'm sorry, is coming. Sorry, where did I get good? Because repetition, he said, is good. Jehovah, the day of Jehovah, the Lord is coming, cometh. Thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Talking about the inhabitants of Jerusalem. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken and the houses rifled, destroyed, plundered. The woman ravished. These evil, wicked sinners will ravish women, rape them. Right? <clears throat> and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. And the remainder of the people, the residue of the people, shall not be cut off from the city. A remnant will remain in the city, Jerusalem. Now pay attention. Then shall Jehovah go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Then Jehovah will come down when the nations gather against Jerusalem. That's when you know Jehovah's coming. When the armies of the nations gather against Jerusalem, be prepared for Jehovah to come down. That's the sign for us believers. Jehovah's coming down. The armies have gathered against Jerusalem. They're about to destroy it. Jehovah's coming down. Come down. Okay, that's what it's saying here. Now, but pay attention to verse 4. I'm going to read 3 again. Then Jehovah go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon a Mount of Olives. What place? Mount of Olives. Whose feet? Jehovah's feet. So Zechariah sees his God Jehovah with feet. And he says, the feet of Jehovah will stand on the Mount of Olives and do what to the Mount? Which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave, torn in half in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And therefore shall be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Now pay attention to five. Five. And ye shall flee to the valley of mountains. For the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Pay attention to the last part. And Jehovah my God shall come. Not a creature. My God, Jehovah himself, is coming and all the saints with thee. Now, guys, let's look at four one more time. Azel is the name of the place, Nate. Please, Nate. I know you love the Lord. For the love of Christ, don't get distracted by these place names. Whether you know what Azel is or not, right? whether you know what Azel is or not, how's that going to help you see the connection with Jesus? Right? Don't let your mind be distracted by Uzziah, the name of the king, or Azel. Who cares? Focus on 14 and 5 again. Notice 14. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, and the mount will be cleaved in half. Now, folks, Zechariah is saying the Mount of Olives will be physically torn in half, literally and physically. And what causes the mount to be split in half? Jehovah's feet touching it. This proves that Jehovah's feet are literal physical feet because the mount will be literally physically split in half by the feet of Jehovah touching it. Well, if the mount will be physically split in half and it's not simply allegorical, that means the cause of, the, of it being split is also physical and literal. What's the cause of it being split? Jehovah's feet landing on it. So just as the mount being split in half is literal physical, the cause of its split, Jehovah's feet touching it, must be literal and physical. 
So Zechariah sees Jehovah with actual physical feet landing on top of the Mount of Olives. Yes, there are people who doubt this and explain it away, specifically anti-Trinitarians and rabbinic Jews. Okay. Did you guys catch it? Whose physical feet will land on the Mount of Olives according to the prophet Zechariah? Zechariah, don't quote to me New Testament. Don't get me upset again. Whose physical feet will physically touch the Mount of Olives, causing it to physically split according to Zechariah 14? You got it, Jehovah God. But no, folks. Acts 1, 9 and 12 says, that's Jesus. Acts 1, 9 and 12 said, Jesus physically left the Mount of Olives and will physically land upon the Mount of Olives when he comes. Zechariah said it's Jehovah. Acts 1 says it's Jesus. What? Did you guys catch it? Did you guys catch it? You see what I was trying to prove last session, but the distractions were too much? Jehovah's physical feet will touch the Mount of Olives when he comes to destroy the armies of the nations that attack the remnant of the Jews to save them. Acts 1, 9 to 12 says, Jesus left the Mount of Olives physically and will come back to the Mount of Olives physically. So it's his blessed feet that split it in half. You understand what you just read? I don't think it sunk in. You know what you just read? You just read Zechariah beholding Jesus' physical feet and seeing Jesus in his physical body descending to the Mount of Olives, which means Zechariah was allowed to see by the Holy Spirit Jesus Christ return in his second coming in his post-resurrected glorified physical body. That's what Zechariah saw. But then you saw Zechariah call Jesus Jehovah his God. He called Jesus Jehovah my God. Is it sinking in? But then Zechariah says he will come with his saints, his holy ones. Verse 5, Zechariah 14, verse 5, the last part. Watch here, Zechariah 14, verse 5, <clears throat> the last part. Read the last part. And Jehovah, my God, he was a Christian because he believed in Jesus. They all were, Alex Gaskin. Not in a sense, they were. And Jehovah, my God, shall come and all the saints with thee. Jehovah, my God, shall come and all the saints with thee. But wait, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 3, 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. When Jesus comes, who does he come with? Who does he come with? To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Wait, 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 Paul. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming with all his saints. Our Lord Jesus Christ is coming with all his saints, yes. But Zechariah says, Jehovah, his God, is coming with all his saints. But wait, let's go to Luke 9, 26. Luke 9, 26. The same author who wrote Acts wrote Luke. What did Jesus say? When he comes, he'll come in the glory of who? Luke 9, 26. Yes, you can decimate Joe's witnesses with Zechariah 14 and Acts and 1 Thessalonians. Luke 9, 26. For whosoever, Jesus speaking, 
For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and his fathers and of the holy angels. So wait, Luke. You're telling me Jesus Christ, our Lord, will come to the Mount of Olives and his feet will touch the Mount of Olives, but he's not coming alone. He's coming with his holy ones, the angels. Yes. But wait, Luke. Zechariah says it's Jehovah, Zechariah's God, who's coming with his saints to the Mount of Olives, and it's Jehovah's feet that touches the Mount of Olives and splits it in half. Yeah. What are you trying to tell me, Luke? Isn't it obvious? I'm trying to tell you Jesus is Jehovah, the God of Zechariah, who comes to the Mount of Olives. And Zechariah saw the blessed feet of Jesus in his glorified, resurrected physical body. Yep, that's David Wood, Hater Wood, listening from Israel because as David Wood has gone on record, at least he's humble in this area, everything he knows I taught him. That's why he considers me the greatest apologist on the planet. See, at least he's humble to admit that because he's right. Don't hate, participate. No, that is him. That's his, that's his account. He's born in Israel, so he's trying to stalk me. Anyway. So everyone clear with me? That in Acts 1, the author, Luke, has portrayed Jesus, has portrayed Jesus as Jehovah God of Zechariah 14. Okay, then that's fine. They're both haters anyway, Andrew Martin. They're both haters. Anyone who imitates hater wood is a hater to the max. Is it clear though? Since we're in the book of Zechariah, let me show you some other nuggets. Zechariah 14, verses 16 to 17. Zechariah 14, verses 16 to 17. Watch here. Let me show you some other nuggets. Zechariah 14, verses 16 to 17. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations. Pay attention, guys. Those nations that didn't go to war and survive Jehovah's destruction of the wicked armies of the Antichrist, watch here, shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year, shall have to go up to Jerusalem year to year to worship the king, Jehovah of hosts. Now watch 17. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Jehovah of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Did you catch this? Not only does Jehovah descend physically to the Mount of Olives, Jehovah will take up his residence in Jerusalem, <clears throat> and he will rule over the earth from Jerusalem, and the survivors of the nations will be required to send representatives from all nations at least once a year to see Jehovah physically, to see Jehovah physically in Jerusalem to worship him. Yep, this is during the thousand-year reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. This has a literal fulfillment in the millennial reign of Christ when Jesus comes to Mount of Olives and settles in Jerusalem and rules in Jerusalem a thousand years with his glorified saints over the nations who do not believe in him but did not make war against him. This will be fulfilled literally, physically. Okay, see that? Not the ceremonial law, but certain holy days will continue to be observed when Jesus returns. Is that clear? Now, let's read Zechariah 14, verse 9. Zechariah 14, verse 9. Watch here. Let's read Zechariah 14, verse 9. 
And Jehovah shall be king over all the earth. And that day shall there be one Jehovah and his name one. Now, guys, you got to follow with me. Zechariah 14 says, Jehovah my God is coming. Jehovah my God will rule as king over all the earth in Jerusalem. And there'll be one king over all the earth because Jehovah's one and his name is one. Did you catch it? When Jehovah comes, who will be the one king over all the earth? According to Zechariah 14. When Jehovah comes, who will be the one king over all the earth? Come on, guys. Pay attention. <clears throat> and Jehovah will reign from where? From what place? He will be ruling from what location? According to Zechariah 14. Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem, correct? Okay. But now I'm confused. Zechariah 14 says, Jehovah will come, land on the Mount of Olives. He will begin ruling in Jerusalem as the one king over all the earth, and all nations must come and worship him. But then I'm confused. Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Zechariah 9, verses 9 and 10. Let's see if you guys are paying attention and connecting the dots. Zechariah 9, verses 9 to 10. I'm confused here. I'm confused. Help me understand this. Zechariah 9, verses 9 to 10. Okay. Read with me. Read. Rejoice greatly. O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh. Don't forget Zechariah 14, verse 9 and 16 and 17. The king of Jerusalem is Jehovah. Your king comes. He is just and having salvation, right? He is just having salvation lowly and riding upon an ass. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace unto the heathen. And his dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from the river even to the ends of the earth. Okay, now I'm really confused. Guys, I'm confused. Zechariah 14 says, the king that comes to Jerusalem who will rule as the one king over all the earth is Jehovah. Jehovah is the king of Jerusalem who will come to Jerusalem to reign from Jerusalem as king over all the earth. But Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Jerusalem's king, Jerusalem's king, will come riding an ass, the foal of a donkey. I think you because you skipped the part, didn't you? Repost Zechariah 9.9 9 in its entirety because you missed the part and skipped the 10. I believe you did. Yep, there's a part of it that you missed. Quote Zechariah 9.9 9 one more time, just verse 9. Zechariah 9 9. Let's see if you guys are getting this. Okay, let's see if you're getting it. Hold on. Okay, read with me. Rejoice. See, that's the second part you, you cut off. Greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Okay. Help me understand this, guys. Help me understand this. Zechariah 14, same author, same book. Zechariah 14 says, Jehovah God will physically descend upon a Mount of Olives. His physical feet will split the Mount of Olives in half. Jehovah God will then begin physically ruling in Jerusalem as the king of Jerusalem and as the one king over all the earth. And the nations then have to go see him physically, Jehovah physically in a physical body in Jerusalem to worship him. He is the king. But Zechariah 9, 9 says that king that comes to save Jerusalem, to save Zion, will ride on a donkey, the foal of an ass. Do you guys understand what you just read? Zechariah, when you read him in context, is saying Jehovah my God will literally ride a donkey. And literally has feet, which will then land upon a Mount of Olives. 
and he will literally reign in Jerusalem. Now, here's the problem, though. For Jehovah God, who is spirit, to ride a donkey means he has to be in a physical body. For Jehovah's feet to split a mount of olives means he has to have a physical body that has physical feet, which can, which can physically ride a donkey. And that physical body must be of a shape and size that's not too big to cause the donkey to collapse from his weight. Did you catch what, what you're reading here? Did you catch it or no? I don't know if it sunk in. If you read Zechariah in context, you take Zechariah 9, verses 9 and 10, and Zechariah 14, verses 1 of 5, Zechariah 14, verse 9, Zechariah 14, 16 to 17. There we are told it is Jehovah God who is Zion king, Jerusalem's king, Israel's king, who comes to save them and deliver them. Jehovah's, Jehovah, Zechariah's God, Jehovah God, his feet will land upon a mount of olives, split it in half. Jehovah God will be the one king ruling over all the earth in Jerusalem. And the nations will have to send representatives to Jehovah in Jerusalem to honor and worship him. But Zechariah 9, 9 says, Zion's king, Israel's king, Jerusalem's king, who comes to save them, will ride a donkey. What more proof do you want? That Zechariah is seeing his God, Jehovah, in a physical body. A physical body that's not too big, that's big enough to ride a donkey without collapsing it. A physical body that has physical feet that touches the Mount of Olives and splits it in half. Come on, Zarina. You're insulting my intelligence. And I know you don't mean it to be blasphemous. How dare anyone liken Mary's womb to a donkey? Sister, I know you didn't mean it to be offensive. Think twice before you say something. That's an insult to the blessed mother of our Lord. Where do you get carried by a donkey means in his mother's womb? Have mercy, my God, Father, Son, Spirit. I have to chasten you for that. Don't ever, ever say that again. Oh, I see what you mean. Sorry, sister. God, forgive me for misinterpreting your words. This is why you have to type more clearly. Forgive me, sister. You're saying when Mary was riding a donkey. Okay, no. It's not about Mary being pregnant with Jesus riding a donkey. Forgive me, sister. Forgive me for misunderstanding you. Forgive me. Lord, have mercy. Okay? Sorry about that, sister. But the way you worded it, I thought you're confusing the two. No. Okay. Now, before I show you the fulfillment, I don't know if you guys are getting it. Before I show you the fulfillment, do you see that the one who rides a cloud in Zechariah 9, 9, Zion's king, Jerusalem's king, Israel's king, is none other than Jehovah? Because Zechariah 14, verse 9 says, Jehovah is the one king of all the earth. He is the one king who rules over, over the earth. His name is one. He is one. And he rules from Jerusalem. And he descends to the Mount of Olives. Do you see there's no way around this? Yes. While Jesus rules during the thousand year reign on, uh, on earth, the Father will still be in heaven. He'll be there during Jesus' thousand year reign on earth. Okay. But do you understand it is Jehovah who's riding the donkey according to the context of Zechariah? I just want to make sure you're getting it. If anyone's confused, let me know. Right? Everyone got it? Okay. Then with that said, Luke 19, 28, to 38. Luke 19, 
28 to 38. What's the question, medic? I hope you don't kill me and ask me a question that's not related. Medic, you know you would get further in life if you're patient? Luke 19, 28 to 38. Luke 19, 28 to 38. Let's read. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. Pay attention. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives. Notice he's at the Mount of Olives. Hmm. Mount of Olives. He's going to be coming to the Mount of Olives, right? He's near the Mount of Olives and he's going to come to the Mount of Olives. What? Read. He sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in that which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. So they found, right? What he had said unto them, right? And because the Lord hath need of them. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. Now watch here. 35. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And he was, there, he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives. <whistles> you see what Jesus is doing? He's coming down the Mount of Olives on a donkey. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works, what they had seen, and saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Do you see what Jesus just did? He fulfilled in his first coming what he will do at his second coming. He comes to the Mount of Olives, so his feet is touching the Mount of Olives, and then he rides the donkey to show... I am Jehovah God of Zechariah 9 and Zechariah 14. I am the God whose feet touch the Mount of Olives. I am the God, your king, who rides the donkey, the foal of a donkey. He does it at his first coming to show he is that God who will then return again to the Mount of Olives, according to Acts 1. So it's not whether it's first or second coming. Jesus does it in his first coming to show you I am that God so expect me to return to the Mount of Olives in the ultimate fulfillment of Zechariah 14. I'm giving you a foretaste of the future. I am partially fulfilling Zechariah 14 now so that you can take to heart. I will fulfill it in the ultimate sense when I return and descend on the Mount of Olives. You understand what he did? For those who know the Old Testament, he was showing them, I am Zechariah's God. I am Zechariah's Jehovah, who touches the Mount of Olives at my feet, who rides the donkey as a foretaste, but expect me to come again to then fulfill Zechariah in its ultimate sense. This is why I said, Medic, be patient, you're going to get your answer. It's not first coming or second coming. It's both comings. So he's giving you the deposit saying, look, I'm going to fulfill Zechariah in part. I'm going to be the one who touches the Mount of Olives and sit on a donkey and enter into Jerusalem, <clears throat> presenting myself as the king of Zechariah. So you have no doubt I am that God of Zechariah. And so expect me to then return to the Mount of Olives, fulfilling Zechariah in its ultimate sense. Let's go to John 12, 12 to 16. Let's tie in John. John 12, 12 to 16. So it's not, is it first coming or second coming? It's both. John 12, 12 to 16. Let's read. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna. 
save, we pray. Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. There, these things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. It may be in our lifetime, faith God child. You don't know that. Don't say it won't. Don't say it will. You don't know that. Okay, you understand what you just read? Let's tie in Luke 19, John 12, and Acts 1. Luke 19, 28 to 38. John 12, 12 to 16, Acts 1, verses 9 and 12. Let's sum it up, tie it in so you can get it. Here's what you just read. Jesus sat on the foal of a donkey as he came down from the Mount of Olives in order to present himself to the Jews. I am your king that Zechariah said would come to bring you salvation. Therefore, I am the God of Zechariah, I am Jehovah in the flesh. And then when he leaves the Mount of Olives in Acts 1, 9 to 12, and the angels tell the disciples he's going to return to the Mount of Olives, what you're supposed to take away from all this, Jesus partially fulfills Zechariah 14 as a foretaste guaranteeing at his return, he will fulfill it in its ultimate sense because he is the one who will return with his holy ones whose physical feet land on the Mount of Olives, splits it in half, who destroys the armies of the Antichrist as he then enters Jerusalem and begins his thousand-year reign on earth in Jerusalem. You catch it? Is it sinking in, what you just read? Is it sinking in what you just read in Luke and Acts? So, is Luke presenting Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty of the Old Testament? Is Luke depicting Jesus as the Jehovah God that Zechariah saw and prophesied in Zechariah 9 and 14? So when a Jehovah Witness or a Muslim or a Unitarian, or a liberal tells you, Jesus is not depicted as Jehovah God Almighty in the Synoptic Gospels. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the companion volume to Luke, Acts, are you ready to decimate them and tear them to shreds? Medic, focus, man, before I bounce you, bro. Are you with me there? And if you want more proof that Zechariah is seeing Jesus by the Holy Spirit and seeing Jesus in his glorified, post-resurrected, physical body of flesh and is worshiping Jesus as Jehovah God, if you want more proof Zechariah was given this revelation, Zechariah 12, verse 10. I want to have to do parts two and three on this set on this series. Multiple parts again, because I'm almost done. Zechariah 12, verse 10. Jehovah God speaking. Zechariah 12, verse 10. Guys, pay attention. Jehovah God speaking. Watch. 12, 10. I don't know why you gave me nine. Protestant, you do this again. I'm going to smash your face and then repent. Zechariah 12, verse 10. Watch here. God speaking. Pay attention. God speaking. And I will pour upon the house of David. I, God, will pour upon the house of David, upon the heavens of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace. This spirit I pour upon them because of my graciousness, my favor. And this spirit will convict them to supplicate me. Grace and supplication means I will pour out the Holy Spirit to convict them to realize their sin. Enable them to repent and cry out to me for forgiveness. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Bam. God says, when I pour out the Spirit upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, then they will realize I am the God they pierced. 
thrust through physically. And they will mourn, cry bitterly for what they've done to me, piercing their God. And mourn for him as an only son. Bam! And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Bam! When Jesus returns, the Jews who survive will realize that Jesus, whom he instigated his crucifixion, he has been our God, he is our God, and we have against him, which is why it says they'll mourn as for an only son, the firstborn, because that's who Jesus is. God's one and only uniquely born son, his firstborn, whom they're pierced through. Catch it? Notice again the partial fulfillment of Zechariah 12.10. When was this partially fulfilled? When he was nailed on the cross and a soldier thrusted him with a spear. Let's read John 19, 34 to 37. John 19, 34 to 37. So notice, Jesus partially fulfilled Zechariah chapter 9 and chapter 14 at his first coming, but the ultimate fulfillment, its complete fulfillment, will take place at his second coming. John 19, 34 to 37. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. So pierced his side physically. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe, for these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Bam! Bam. When the soldier thrust Jesus through with a spear, he was fulfilling Zechariah 12.10 in part. But its ultimate fulfillment takes place when he comes. Revelation 1.7. Revelation 1.7. Revelation 1.7. Here's when it will be fulfilled in its totality. Behold, he cometh with the clouds. Now pay attention. Notice the language. That's Daniel 7, 13. And every eye shall see him, and also those which pierced him. Bam! Here's now the ultimate fulfillment of Zechariah 12. When he comes in the clouds, those who pierced him will recognize him, and all kindreds, tribes of the earth, shall wail, shall mourn, shall cry because of him. Even so, amen. Wow! Andrew. Bone shall not be broken is Exodus 12, verse 46. Exodus 12, verse 46. John is describing Jesus as the Passover lamb whose bones would not be broken. Exodus 12, verse 46. Watch here. Exodus 12, 46. The one-year-old male Passover lamb the bones could not be broken. And Jesus is the male Passover lamb who was slaughtered for our salvation. Exodus 12, verse 46. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry with out of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. And how, remember how the gospel began, Andrew? In John 1, 29 and 36, John the Baptist looked at Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You're catching it now? No, no. It doesn't mean those who pierce will be resurrected. This is what we call corporate solidarity. Jonathan Simon, pay attention. Oftentimes, the actions of your ancestors or of the particular group that you are associated with or belong to will be ascribed to that group collectively, irrespective of time and place. So pay attention. What do I mean by that? The Bible functions or the Bible describes people as 
corporations, so to speak, groups that are connected either physically and or spiritually, meaning <clears throat> if I'm part of the Jews, then what my ancestors did in the past will be attributed to me today. That's how the Bible works and functions, which is why you'll find in the Bible later generation of Jews being held accountable and condemned for the sins of their ancestors. And this also functions on a spiritual level, on a spiritual level, meaning if I belong to a group spiritually because I act like them, believe like them, right, <clears throat> then I'm part of them. The actions of those who came before me will be attributed to me. You and me there? Okay. Are you with me there? Brother, are you there? I want to make sure you're getting it. I don't know why the admins are slow from muzzling these filthy dogs of Satan. Is that clear? Let me show you that from the teachings of Jesus. Matthew 23, 32 to 33. Matthew 23, 32, 33. Jonathan, Simon, pay attention. Watch here. Pay attention now because I'm almost done in this session. Yep, the Lord's Pascha. But now let me give you proof, Jonathan. Pay attention to what Jesus says. Protestant believer. Oh, my goodness. Protestant believer. Oh, my goodness. Protestant believer. Dude, do you got wax in your ears? I didn't say 22, 23. Can you let me come to your house and just beat your face in? Smash your face in? Because I'm going to enjoy breaking your jaw and then having a reason to repent. I don't pay you nothing for nothing. Matthew 23, 32 to 33. Stop making excuses that my sound is breaking up. Don't be like your ancestor, Adam. Take responsibility for your sins. Matthew 23, 32 to 33. Okay, guys. Again, back on. Okay. We're buffering badly. Hold back. Okay. And then I'm going to use your jaw to kill the Philistines like Samson did. The jawbone of an ass. All right. Matthew 23. 32 to 33. Send George Techie to Fairyland. See, hey, uh, first and last, you're dropping a ball too. I want to kick your face in too and repent. Matthew 23, 32 to 33. One more time. Guys, pay attention. Guys, now read. Jesus speaking to the Jews of his day. Read. Fill ye up, up then the measures of your fathers. Fill up the sins that your fathers before you committed. Complete their sins. Complete their sins. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Let's post it again because we're going to go into meat. Are you ready for meat? Let's post it again. So we're going to go into meat. Okay, this is where I need you to pay attention. Jesus says to the Jews, fill up the measure of your fathers. What does he mean? God will only tolerate a certain number of sins before you return the point of no return. There's a limit of sins, how much God will tolerate from a nation, from a group, from an individual. Once they reach that limit, it's over for them. No mercy but judgment. So here Jesus is saying, you'll be that generation that will now reach the full measure of the limit of sins that God will tolerate from the Jews. And you'll be that generation that God will now destroy because you are that generation that now reaches the measure of how much sin God will tolerate. Okay? Let's look at it again. Matthew 23, 32, 33. Okay? Now read. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Fill it up. You're this generation. You're going to fill it up and it'll be over for Jerusalem. But then catch 33. Catch 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Notice what he called them. You are serpents and you are the generation of vipers. 
Not only you serpents, but you come from vipers. Pay attention to serpents and vipers. Serpents and vipers. Are you paying attention? You caught it, right? He calls those Jews serpents and vipers. Now read 35 and 36. 35, 36. Let's see if you're catching this. 35 and 36. Jericho, pay attention. 35 and 36. Exactly, Zarina. Pay attention. That upon you may come. The judgment will fall on you. For all the righteous blood shed, for all the righteous people that you and your ancestors murdered, shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom ye slew. You slew Zechariah. Verily I send to you, all these things shall come upon the generation. Now, let's unpack this. Okay. He says, you killed Zechariah, son of Berechiah. You slew him between the temple and, and the altar. Guys, here's the problem. The Jews of Jesus' day did not kill that Zechariah. That Zechariah was killed in 2 Chronicles. He was killed by their Jewish ancestors. Why is Jesus saying, you killed him? When this was a crime committed 500 years before. Matthew 23, 36. 35 and 36. One more time. Matthew 23, 35, 36. You got it, Zarina. Mikhail, you got it. Because they are part of the same people committing the same kind of sins, following in the footsteps of their wicked, perverse, unregenerate ancestors. And so you share in their guilt because you are like them and you act like them and you know better than them. Are you catching it? Read it again. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you slew between the temple and altar, altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Now let me break this down, what Jesus is saying. From the murder of Abel until the last person that I will allow you to murder in this generation, all of these crimes, all of these sins will finally fall on you because you're the generation that now will reach the breaking point of how much sin God will tolerate and it will be over for you. It's done. So let me unpack this. Let's see if you get it. Okay, let me tell you what he's saying here. There is an amount and limit of sin that God will tolerate. So he's, he waits patiently, generation after generation, and he says, okay, you won't repent? Okay, I'll wait another generation. You won't repent? I'll wait another generation. You won't repent? I'll wait another generation. That's it. This is the final generation because now you reach a limit of sin I can't tolerate anymore. Now I will destroy you and wipe you from before my face. You understand? That's exactly why God made Abraham wait 400 years before Abraham's descendants would take Canaan. Because in Genesis 15, verse 16, notice what he says. Genesis 15, verse 16. Notice what he says to Abraham. Yep, like Noah's flood. He waited 120 years. Genesis 15, 16. Watch what God says to Abraham. You know why, Abraham? I'm going to wait 400 years to give this land to your descendants. 16, right there. But in the fourth generation, which you read earlier, it's 400 years. They shall come hither again. Then your descendants will come out of Egypt here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. That's why I'm waiting 400 years, Abraham. Because the iniquity, the sins of the Canaanites, the Amorites, hasn't been full yet. When will it be full? 400 years. I will wait patiently. And that's when they reach the full measure where it's now the point of no return. They've now reached the limit. They can't go beyond. And now I will punish them. You understand the patience of God here? You understand what God is telling you? 
For 400 years, God watched each generation of Canaanites murder their children to Molech, commit bestiality, commit incest, lie, cheat, the most horrendous sins imaginable, and each generation, he tolerated it, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited. He put up with homosexuality, lesbianism, incest, bestiality, murdering innocent children, lying, stealing, you name it. So when people look at God destroying the Canaanites and they say how cruel, no, that's actually... Sorry. When people look at God wiping out the Canaanites and say how cruel, no, that's actually a proof of God's patience, mercy, and compassion because he tolerated with each generation for 400 years. And then he says, now what do you want me to do? So why did he say that? Because he was showing you that even when he killed the children, the children would be no better than their ancestors because each generation of infants continued in the wickedness and evil and filth of the generation before them. So was God evil or was he just? And he demonstrated his justice, his patience and love, and tolerating it for 400 years. Right? So you see what Jesus is saying to the Jews of his day? You know what he's saying? You're the final generation of Jews that God will tolerate. You are that generation that will now reach the limit of sin that God now says, enough, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. You've reached the point of no return. I'm going to wipe out Jerusalem. I'm going to wipe out the temple, and I'm done with you. You know what Jesus meant here? You know what he meant by done? Because prior to that, God had scattered the Jews from Jerusalem, but he returned them, right? Remember the Babylonian captivity? Within seven years, he brought them back. You know what he means here now? He means now things are different. Though when you turn to me, I brought you back, this time it's different. You know what would be different this time? Guys, I need your ears. I'm almost done. I'm going to go into meat. I need your ears. You know what would be different this time? Unlike the previous captivity in Babylon where he brought them back in 70 years and let them rebuild Jerusalem, this time it would be a divorce that would be indefinite, meaning now I'll give you what you want. Now I'm going to divorce you indefinitely and I won't take you back. I'm going to hand you over to your lovers to punish you for an indefinite period of time. I will not turn back to you and bring you back to the land, not for the foreseeable future, and will not allow you to rebuild the temple, which is why for over 1,900 years, the Jews were not allowed to return to their land until 1948, which is why even till now, he has not allowed them to rebuild the temple, and he'll only do so when he's about to descend and then restore them again. He goes, that's it. This is why even the Jews don't understand. If you ask an Orthodox Jew, don't take my word for it. What crime did you commit? What sin did you commit that was so great that God scattered you from the land, destroyed your temple, and for 1,900 years left you without a land, scattered you from nation to nation, and allowed the nations to beat you and oppress you and kill you? And till this day, he's not allowed you to restore your temple what sin did you commit that was so great to do this? Whereas when you did it the first time and he destroyed Jerusalem the first time and the temple was destroyed the first time, he brought you back within 70 years. The sin of having their Messiah pierced. The sin of handing over their God in the flesh to be killed by the hands of the Romans. And Tovia Singer proves that Muhammad is a dog, a son of Satan, Ishmael. No, 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 wait, wait. Let me show you how Tovia Singer proves Muhammad is a filthy dog, a son of Satan. Ishmael, Tovia Singer thinks that Jesus is a false messiah. 
Your prophet Muhammad thinks that Jesus is the Messiah. So Tovia Singer proves that your prophet is a dog of Satan who's burning in hell because he believes Jesus is a Messiah, and Tovia Singer says he's not. You see how stupid you are? Only Muhammad could produce such stupid children of Satan. May God have mercy on them and save them from Muhammad. Okay. Is that clear now? Is that clear? Now, coming back to the point, did you see that Jesus said the Jews of his day, the Jews of his day are responsible for the crime of their ancestors killing Abel? Let's go Matthew 23, 35 one more time. I'm almost done. Matthew 23, 35. Watch here. I'm almost done. Matthew 23, 35. Okay, read here. That upon you may come all upon all that upon you may come all the righteous bloodshed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel, righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias. Why will it fall on them? Matthew 23, 32. Why will the murder of Abel fall on them? Because he was murdered by their fathers, their ancestors. Matthew 23, 32. Now here, get ready for a shock. Get ready for a shock, folks. Shock your system. Shock your system. Matthew 23, 32. Feel ye up then the measure of your fathers. Fill up the sin started by your fathers. Okay, now guys, follow me. Wait. You will be the generation that fills up the amount of sins that your father started. God will tolerate. Your father's sin. You'll be the generation that now reaches the full measure of the sin that God will tolerate from your fathers and you. One of the sins of their fathers, pay attention, one of the sins of their fathers is that they murdered Abel. But folks, wait. Abel was murdered by Cain before the flood. None of Cain's descendants survived the flood. Only Noah's family survived. Why is Jesus saying that Abel was murdered by your ancestor, who happens to be Cain, when Cain has no physical connection with these Jews? Cain is the one who murdered Abel. And Jesus says, you're that generation that will fulfill the sins committed by your ancestor, including Cain. Because Jesus is not talking about physical ancestry. He's talking about spiritual lineage. He's saying, you Jews, though you think you belong to Abraham, you don't belong to him. You belong to Cain, your true spiritual father, because all of you are the sons of Satan. Anyone Jew first who rejects Jesus shows they have the same father, the devil. And who was the devil's firstborn son? Cain. Go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. Exactly, Elizabeth Tudor. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. Now, at, as Cain, who was of the wicked one, Cain belonged to the wicked one, the devil, and slew his brother. And whereof slew he him? Why did he slew him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Wow. So you Jews will be accountable for what your ancestor Cain did to, to Abel because Cain belonged to the evil one. And you, like Cain, don't belong to Abraham, though you're physical Jews. You belong to Cain, who belongs to Satan, because you and Cain are all sons of the devil. John 8, 44. John 8, 44. You catch it? John 8, 44. Watch. A lot of meat today. You got to listen to this over and over again until you understand the arguments and then share it with others and hit the like button. 
John 8, 44, physical Jews, physical Jews, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. <clears throat> when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. You physical Jews who deny me, you belong to Satan, your true father. Therefore, Cain is your ancestor, not Abraham. Wow. You don't belong to Abraham, though you are his physical sons. You belong to Cain, your true ancestor, because all of you are the seed of the devil, the offspring of Satan. Now let's go to Matthew 23, 33, because this is the icing on the cake. Icing on the cake. Yep, Zach Ali. Abel represents the church. Cain, unregenerate sinners reject Jesus. No, Zarina, when you reject Jesus, deny Jesus, don't turn to Jesus, you belong to the devil, belong to Cain. Now watch this. Notice what he calls these physical Jews who reject him. Notice, not all physical Jews. The physical Jews like Tovia Singer, that filthy dog, Tovia Singer, that dog who's surely of the devil, he's talking of him. But physical Jews who believe in Jesus like Michael Brown, they are truly the seed of Abraham and belong to Christ. Matthew 23, 33. Read this. Notice what he calls them. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? You know why he's calling them serpents? Genesis 3, 14 and 15. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. Here's why. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. And Jehovah God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go. And thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now watch. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Here's the story of the Bible, folks. Satan has spiritual seed. And the woman produces spiritual seed for God. The first seed of Satan was Cain. The first seed of the woman was Abel, whom Cain killed. That's why Jesus referred to the physical Jews, you are serpents, children of vipers, because you belong to the serpent, the devil. You don't belong to the woman or her seed. Did it sink in? Did it sink in? You physical Jews who reject me and hate me and kill me and kill my followers, you are proof you are of Cain. He's your ancestor. And all of you are serpents and you are the seed of the serpent who is at war with the seed of the woman, the offspring of God. That's why, here let me shock you, that's why Cain is never listed in Adam's genealogy. Genesis chapter 5 is the genealogy of Adam. First Chronicles chapter 1 gives you the genealogy of Adam and Luke 3, and Cain is never listed in Adam's genealogy. Do you know that? Never, never is Cain included in Adam's genealogy? Genesis 5, 1 Chronicles 1, Luke 3. And that's why God gave Seth as the replacement of Abel, appointed Seth in the place of Abel to continue Adam's line because Cain was rejected. So, Jonathan, now you understand Revelation 1-7, when it says, and those who pierced him, it's not talking about the people of Jesus' time, that actual generation. It's talking about their descendants. This is called corporate solidarity. They're all lumped together.
because they belong to the same source. Is that making sense now, Jonathan Simon? Okay. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. Please forgive us and give us power to die to the flesh and walk in the life and the power of the Holy Spirit to love you, Lord. And Lord Jesus, please fight for us. Fight for my children. Bring them to me. Provide abundantly my daily provisions and for my daughters. Please, Lord Jesus. And please grant me divine favor here to stay here for the foreseeable future and they won't send me back. Please, Lord Jesus. Please open doors of blessing and close the doors of opposition. And save me from that wicked judge of the devil in Chicago. And bless my brothers and sisters and strengthen them, Lord Jesus. And please use us to glorify you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Bless us and fill us to love you and bless you always in Jesus' name. Amen. Pray for me, guys. Pray for a miracle that I stay here. They don't send me back and start ministries here. And if you want to support me financially, you can do so on my Patreon pages or via PayPal to continue to do this work and to get on my feet and take care of my daughters and for miraculous favor to shut this door of opposition on this wicked judge and to give me favor here for the glory of Jesus. Christ is risen, risen indeed. I'll see you guys this week, perhaps tomorrow, Lord Jesus willing, all right? Hit the like button, watch this over again, pass it on to others. And then teach this material for the glory of Christ. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Love you guys.